tonight they're riding in on buses. We're going to Washington, D.C. Flying in on planes. The streets of the Capitol are filled with people from all over America ready to celebrate the inauguration of Barack Obama. I'm Katie Couric in Washington. Also tonight, on the day before he moves into the White House, the president-elect helps brighten up a home for the homeless to honor Dr. Martin Luther King. And we'll show you how the president-elect plans to honor another of his heroes when he puts his hand on this Bible. This is the CBS Evening News with Katie Couric reporting tonight from Capitol Hill. And good evening, everyone. This city belongs to everyone in America, and it almost seems like everyone in America has come here to claim it. Washington, D.C. is already filled with people and the people overflowing with excitement as they celebrate the inauguration of a new president. Barack Obama will be sworn in there at the west front of the Capitol at noon tomorrow. Our chief White House correspondent, Chip Reed, is out on the platform. He's the warm-up warm act tonight. And Chip, in his final hours as a private citizen on this Martin Luther King holiday, I understand Mr. Obama was hard at work. That's right, Katie. He was hard at work on two fronts, making final edits on that all-important inaugural address and pitching in as a volunteer. No water dripping. On this National Day of Service, President-elect Obama helped spruce up a shelter for homeless teenagers in Washington. We can't allow any uh, idle hands. Everybody's going to have to pitch in. And I think American people are ready to do that. Later, he told volunteers that in these tough economic times, government can't do it all. We're going to have to take responsibility, all of us. And so this is not just a one-day affair. He told the crowd he had to keep his remarks short. I've got to save all my best lines for tomorrow. Saving them for his inaugural address, the most important speech he's ever made. He's been working on it for two months, according to senior advisors, who say his chief speechwriter wrote the first couple drafts. Then Mr. Obama took his turn and, editing in red type, rewrote almost the entire speech in his own words. Advisors say he previewed some of the themes of his inaugural this past weekend. During his whistle-stop tour from Philadelphia to Washington and in a speech in front of the Lincoln Memorial, in particular, that Americans have overcome daunting odds throughout U.S. history. I stand here today as hopeful as ever that the United States of America will endure, that it will prevail, that the dream of our founders will live on in our time. He's been studying Abraham Lincoln's inaugural addresses, especially his second from 1865, a masterpiece that ran a mere seven minutes. Another speech, much admired by Mr. Obama, is John F. Kennedy's in 1961. That we shall pay any price, bear any burden. Which timed in at only 14 minutes. Mr. Obama is reportedly trying to keep his speech at less than 20 minutes. Vice President-elect Joe Biden also pitched in today and later appeared on The Oprah Winfrey Show, where his wife Jill suggested that he had been offered the choice of two jobs. Joe had the choice to be Secretary of State or Vice President. And I said, Joe, oh. well, okay, he did. Now, late today, sources with the Obama, can Obama transition say that Mr. Obama and Mr. Biden did discuss the Secretary of State job, but in the end, Mr. Biden was offered just one job, vice president, for which he'll be sworn in tomorrow. Katie? Trying to make sure they don't ruffle any feathers, I'm sure. Chip Reed, Chip, thank you so much. This town has really taken on a party atmosphere, and west of where Chip is standing, our Cheryl Ackeson is on the National Mall, what's sometimes called America's front yard, and it's where the overflow crowd will be watching this inauguration. And Cheryl, are people camping out there until tomorrow? Not officially. Camping is not officially allowed here in the District of Columbia, but people have told us they plan to sleep in their cars and on tour buses. I think it's fair to say the masses have arrived. Hello, Larry. How y'all doing? Hi. It's a party. <laughs> Call it an adventure, a pilgrimage, or simply the Obama Express. So I can't hold myself in. I'm so excited. Hundreds of thousands are pouring into Washington, D.C. for what may be the biggest event here in history. <laughs> Helen Barnes is flying from Mississippi. It's going to be president of these United States. The last time she came to the Capitol, it was for the 1963 Civil Rights March. The Richards from Miami have their tickets. We have seats 
in the orange level, <laughs> up the back steps of the Capitol. The Fords from Pennsylvania are set for tickets too, but wondering how they'll get around. My biggest concern is if in fact the, the subway system is just overloaded and we're not able to, to get on. There's reason for concern. Yesterday's pre-inaugural activity set a metro record for Sundays in Washington. By tomorrow, there will be up to 10,000 charter buses, and most of the city's 29,000 hotel rooms are filled. The Secret Service estimates up to 2 million people could converge here, more than triple the city's population. That would be a bigger crowd than Martin Luther King's Civil Rights March, the Million Man March, and the biggest Vietnam War protest combined. We're going to Washington, D.C. So it's a real exercise in faith that so many, like these Chicago church members boarding buses this afternoon, are coming with no tickets, no hotel rooms, and no idea of how they'll get around amid tight security. We're just going and prayerfully we'll see something. Others are like Wadud Ahmad, who thought about coming from Philadelphia but took a pass because of the crowds. God forbid if you have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> There will be 5,000 porta potties, all part of the massive preparation. And here's some important news. The estimated crowd capacity along the parade route is no more than 300 to 350,000 people. And the Secret Service says once that number is reached, they're shutting off all the entrances, even to people who already have tickets. Katie? All right, Cheryl Atkinson. Cheryl, thank you. When George Washington arrived in New York for the first inauguration, he was met by an Army officer assigned to his security. The president-elect told him, quote, the affection of my fellow citizens is the only guard I want. My, how times have changed. Bob Orr has a look at the tightest security for an inauguration ever. River and air patrols. Bomb sniffing dogs and undercover agents are all on guard, looking for anything resembling a threat. A record crowd in the swearing in of America's first African American president present a double worry for the FBI. We're asking our agents and our partners to go back, recontact sources, to ensure that we've scrubbed and re scrubbed every potential threat that we have. A three and a half square mile red zone from the White House to the National Mall to the Capitol is virtually locked down. 20,000 law enforcement officers will be backed up by more than 16,000 National Guard and active duty troops. We look at every type of threat out there, whether we're talking about a, uh, a simple uh, lone individual type uh, threat or something that is a, a more complicated, uh, organized uh, terrorist type. Those nearest to the swearing in and those lining the parade route will be heavily screened, their movements restricted. It would be impossible to run everyone through metal detectors, and spectators are expected to outnumber police about 100 to 1. So surveillance cameras will be critical in spotting potential trouble. Some 5,000 cameras spread all through the city will pipe real-time images into security command centers. So it's going to be constant information flow and constant on-the-ground eyes and ears. Officials say there is no known threat against President-elect Obama, but they recognize the inauguration is an attractive target. There's no question that an African-American president will excite a certain small element of the population that's prejudiced or otherwise uh, disturbed or have an ax to grind. Critics say all of this security may be overkill. The Secret Service says it'll take that criticism, though, rather than risk having to explain why something important wasn't done. Katie? All right, Bob or Bob, thanks very much. As Chip Reed mentioned earlier, Barack Obama is putting the final touches on his inaugural address. Former Nixon speechwriter Bill Sapphire says that for a speech to be memorable, it takes a few carefully crafted phrases that are memorable in themselves. More about that now from another former speechwriter, our own Jeff Greenfield. 215 years, 42 men, 55 speeches. Most of them forgotten almost as soon as the words were spoken. So what makes for a memorable inaugural? Consider Lincoln's second inaugural, delivered as the Civil War was ending. Lincoln's second is a masterpiece of concision. It packs a punch. It says, this is what the war was, and this is what we must do now. Lincoln's pleas to bind up the nation's wounds with malice toward none, with charity for all, took on special power when his assassination just six weeks later left those wounds to fester in the post-war years. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. It was the moment in 1933 that made Franklin Roosevelt's first inaugural a classic. The nation's very economic survival was in doubt. 
Unlike Lincoln's bring us together message, FDR delivered a scorching partisan attack on the unscrupulous money changers for their stubbornness and incompetence. And he promised to wield unprecedented presidential power. To wage a war against the emergency, as great as the power that would be given to me if we were in fact invaded by a foreign foe. Ask not what your country can do for you. When John Kennedy was sworn in in 1961, it wasn't a crisis he had to address, but doubts about his stature, the youngest president ever elected. So he spoke almost wholly to the world community, friends and foes, blending resolve and conciliation. Let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. Barack Obama gained the White House in good measure because of the speeches he made. But with the looming economic fears, it is what he says, more than how he says it, that will be the measure of his success. He has the opportunity to look at his political foes and say, this is no time for politics as usual. Work with me. Help us. There's one more must, brevity. In fact, length can be fatal. In 1841, William Henry Harrison talked so long, an hour and 40 minutes, he caught pneumonia and died a month later. Katie? All right, Jeff Greenfield, words of caution there. Thank you, Jeff. Bob Schieffer is our chief Washington correspondent and anchor of Face the Nation. And Bob, I know you've been covering inauguration since LBJ's back in 1965, but you've never really seen anything quite like this it one. It is impossible to overstate the atmosphere. There's this kind of feeling of goodwill that seems to have settled over the Capitol, Katie. It's, uh, I, I've never really seen anything like it. I did an interview with Bill Sapphire, who writes speeches, wrote speeches for Richard Nixon. Nixon. And he said to me in the interview, I really want him to succeed. You know, that, that's really something when you stop and think about it. And I think there's that feeling all over Washington, much different than some of the inaugurations that we've seen in the past. Which have been filled with rancor at, at times, right? right? Yeah. I mean, remember when, uh, when uh, George Bush came here in 2000, there was so much anger still swelling up after what had happened in Florida. A lot of people didn't think he was a legitimate president. Uh, the Clinton people, uh, uh, the Bush people said they'd trash the offices at the oh, White right, House. Oh, right, and took the W's out of yeah, uh, off the keyboard. Yeah, and, and they all denied it and said the, the uh, Bush people were trashing them. But, I mean, it was, just, it was just a lot of friction. This time, everything has gone really smoothly. I'm told at uh, 12.01, the new president's uh, chief legal counsel, Greg Craig, will be in the White House. 20 White House aides will be there to start work immediately. Now, they're not going to do a lot of work, but just the symbolism of it going so smoothly, starting at once, I think it's it's really something. Well, I look forward to being with you, Bob, all We're day tomorrow. We're going to be here all day. We're going to have a good time. Thank <laughs> you are. so much, Bob. Among the VIPs at the inauguration, by the way, will be the crew of the U.S. Airways flight that splash landed in the Hudson River last week. Everyone survived. Tonight, the plane is at a New Jersey salvage yard where it will be taken apart for inspection. The black boxes are expected to confirm that a bird strike caused both engines to shut down. Coming up next, right here on the CBS Evening News, for now, the fighting is over in Gaza, but Israel is still under fire over its tactics. Israeli officials said today they'll have all their troops out of Gaza by the time Barack Obama is sworn in. A ceasefire has stopped the war with Hamas, but not before more than 1,200 Palestinians were killed and thousands of buildings demolished. Meanwhile, Western journalists were allowed inside Gaza for the first time today. Among them, Alan Pizzi. The massive destruction in Gaza has left Israel open to charges of excessive use of force to the point of being vindictive and more. Khalid Abed Rabo says an Israeli tank parked outside his house. This is the toy of my little daughter who was killed, he says. Khalid claims he and his family came out with a white flag. One of the soldiers got out of the tank and opened fire on us, he says, and I shouted, what are you doing? But he kept shooting. Four-year-old Samer was hit in the spine and may end up paralyzed. Her two sisters were killed. The Israelis denounced charges of possible war crimes leveled by UN agencies and human rights groups, but say they are investigating five reports of attacks against civilians. This old man, sitting alone on the roof of his house, says he is waiting for God to help him and his family because no one else will. Where is the world, Majid Athamna asks. Let them come and see what Israel has done to us. 
What they have done, his son Ra'ed says, is take away the homes and livelihood of an extended family of 60 people. I lose everything. Now I am the same when you get from your mom. I don't have nothing. Women in another village claim a 45-year-old mother was shot in the head after they obeyed an Israeli order to leave their homes. Whatever reasons are given for this war, no matter who gets the blame for starting it, the people whose lives were destroyed in it are convinced it was a simple case of collective punishment. Whatever the truth may be, there's no arguing the tragedy. Alan Pizzi, CBS News, Gaza. Meanwhile, in this country, a growing number of products made with peanut butter are being recalled. Peanut butter is, a, is suspected in a salmonella outbreak that's killed at least six people and made more than 470 sick in 43 states. Health officials suggest avoiding crackers, cookies, ice cream, and other snacks containing peanut butter. So far, it appears most jars of peanut butter, though, are safe. For more on this story, you can go to cbsnews.com and click on health for a list of companies recalling their products. Coming up next, he's not even president yet, but Barack Obama has business booming, the selling of a president in a moment. You know, everywhere you look in this town, someone's selling Barack Obama memorabilia. Anthony Mason tells us the man who's promising to fix the economy is already giving it an inaugural boost. His image is on everything. His name inscribed in hats, fine china, this priceless work of art, and song. Barack Obama, Barack Obama. Never mind the recession, the business of Obama is booming. We even sell an Obama dollar bill now that has his picture on it uh, for $10. By some estimates, the Obama industry is worth at least a quarter of a billion dollars. And oh my gosh, look at the back. QVC expects 200,000 customers will have bought Obama items by the end of Inauguration Day. This is our button room where we produced 10 million buttons the past two years. In Greenville, Ohio, Tiger Eye Design makes more than a thousand different Obama buttons. This is the largest effect that any candidate has ever had. The button room operates round the clock seven days a week. Two years ago, Tiger Eye was a $2 million a year company. Today, after Obama, they do more than 10 times that in business. We've gone from 20 full-time employees to over 60. In New York, Jason Feinberg, a former school teacher, was loading up Obama action figures to take to the inauguration. He's already sold 150,000. I've made over a million dollars. When Marvel released a Spider-Man Obama comic last week, the line stretched down the street at a New York store. The Spidey Meets the President issue sold out in hours. To memorabilia dealers, the president-elect is better than a superhero. I, I love that man. He's a one-man economic stimulus package. Barack Obama. Anthony Mason, CBS Obama. News, Greenville, Ohio. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. Dr. Martin Luther King in Memphis back in 1968. King and Abraham Lincoln paved the way for the man who will become president tomorrow. Barack Obama has been paying tribute to King this holiday weekend. And tomorrow, Bill Plant reports he'll honor Lincoln in a special way. So here we have the inaugural Bible of Abraham Lincoln. They call this the Lincoln Bible. It looks like it's held up pretty well. It is. It's in, it's in, I would say, tolerably good condition. In good condition, but it's not really the Lincoln Family Bible. With the Civil War about to erupt and an assassination threat in Baltimore, Lincoln slipped into Washington in the middle of the night. His belongings and his Bible were still en route. So Abraham Lincoln shows up for his first inauguration. Yes. He doesn't have a Bible, and the Chief Justice is there to swear him in. Sends his clerk to get one? A, a very like, that's a very likely scenario for what happened. And this is what he brings back. This is what he brings back. The clerk of the Supreme Court, William Thomas Carroll, brought back one of the many Bibles he kept for official use, then signed and sealed it. On that day, Lincoln spoke to a nation in crisis, about to split in two. As Lincoln said to a nation far more divided than ours,
And on election night, Obama echoed Lincoln's words. We are not enemies, but friends. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. For inspiration tomorrow, Obama has been reading Lincoln's second inaugural address. Changing words even to the very end. He's a wordsmith. Shown to us by John Sellers of the Library of Congress. The final paragraph is really one of the most moving things he's ever written. With malice toward none, with charity for all. In Abraham Lincoln's rise from nothing and in his determination, Barack Obama sees a model to inspire, to guide, and to unite. Bill Plant, CBS News, the White House. And that is the CBS Evening News for tonight. Our Inauguration Day coverage begins tomorrow morning on The Early Show. Then I'll be here with our entire team to bring you all the events of the day, followed by an expanded edition of the CBS Evening News. Then a primetime inauguration special tomorrow night at 9, 8 central. With thanks to the Jones Day Law Firm for this view of the Capitol, I'm Katie Couric. I'll see you in the morning. Good night.